Hi, environmental science students. We're going to continue uh, talking about aquatic and terrestrial pollution with this PowerPoint. I have the same disclosure that I had last class, so read through this if you didn't read through it last time. And let's just jump right in. So most of what we're going to talk about is going to continue this topic 8.2, Human Impacts on Ecosystems. Last uh, PowerPoint, we talked about ecological tolerances, or at least I re um, try to refresh your memory on some ecological tolerances, but you should know those. We've already talked about coral reefs um, way back in our biodiversity unit, so I'll reference you to that there. We're not going to talk about coral reefs today. We are going to talk about oil spills. We talked about oceanic dead zones in the last PowerPoint. We talked about ocean, um, sorry, oxygen sag curves. Today we'll talk about heavy metals. We talked about litter in the last one. And we talked about sediment in the last one, but we will talk about mercury and methylmercury. Okay. We're also going to just um, talk about endocrine disruptors. So just be able to describe endocrine disruptors and describe the effects of them on ecosystems and persistent organic pollutants or POPs, but I'll typically just say POPs or persistent organic pollutants and describe the effect that they have on ecosystems. And then finally, bioaccumulation and biomagnification, um, be able to describe those two concepts and describe the effects that they have on human health and the environment. And this may be a concept that you're familiar with from biology class. Here's the vocab, which I'm going to skip. And this is kind of like a two part lecture. So the last time we talked about all of these ones on the top, and here we're going to talk about the second set of um, pollutants and impacts on ecosystems that we have. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. And it's really in no particular order. It's just the order that I chose to discuss them in. All right, so heavy metals is where we're going to start. Now, the broad definition is any metal with a high density and atomic mass. Usually what you're going to be looking at for heavy metals is your transition metals and then the heavier of the um, basic metals. So maybe gallium and down as well as these groups down here. So those are what you're going to be looking at um, for heavy metals in a chemistry class, for example. But the definition that I want to use for environmental science is a metal with high density and atomic mass. Really, that's not the important part. I don't really care about that part because a lot of the time we're going to consider aluminum to be a heavy metal, especially if it's aluminum ions that are getting into your um, waterways or into your soil. Those ha aluminum has a pretty small atomic mass, okay, um, especially compared to something like iron or lead. For here, the important part is metals that are potentially toxic to plants and or animals, including humans. And some of these aren't even true metals. Arsenic, for example, we're going to consider a heavy metal, but it's what we call a um, semi-metal, okay, one of these staircase metals. All right. So for this class, just any metal or metalloid that is toxic to plants or animals, and they typically have a high atomic mass and a high density. That's going to include mercury, lead, cadmium, this list that I have down here, as well as some other that are less common. But some of these metals have niche applications used in industry, and you'll see them pop up here or there. But these are the major ones that we're going to discuss. Now, the sources of heavy metals, they can leach from mines. They can leach from mine tailings. We talked about that um, when we talked about mining. They can leach from overburden. They can leach from slag, any of that process from mining. They can be discharged from industry. So this is an example of industrial waste that's being discharged directly in the river. And you can see that metallic coppery color. I'm not sure what metals are in there, but it's probably laden with heavy metals. It can leach from landfills. So just scrap metal. Um, you can have uh, you can have the leachate in a landfill leaching out heavy metals. We talked about that. Um, actually, we'll talk about it in one of the future PowerPoints, the next PowerPoint, I believe, uh, where it talks about um, the acidity of the landfill from volatile, uh, volatile um, fatty acids driving down the pH. And these heavy metals leach out in greater concentrations or leach out more readily at low pH. So when you have low pH, more acidic conditions, you're going to have high leaching of heavy metals. Okay, it can leach from uh, from electronic waste happens a lot, and from fossil fuel combustion. This is primarily mercury. Okay, which is atomic symbol HG. 
So what are the effects of heavy metals? Well, they're going to vary based off of the chemical that you're actually talking about, about the element that you're actually talking about. But in general, they're going to cause reduced growth and reproduction in plants, and it can make the soil so toxic that no plants can survive, or only a few plants with specially adapted um, that are specially adapted for heavy metal soils can survive. There is um, groups of plants that are specially adapted for soils that are high in heavy metals, typically occur around volcanoes where heavy metals weather out of the rock and accumulate in the soil, and these plants are specially adapted for um, heavy metal soils. Okay, but if we don't have those naturally adapted plants, then it can be so toxic that nothing can survive there, right? You don't see much growing on this side of this montailing uh, pond, but you see some plants that are able to tolerate it over there. In animals, they're typically going to cause, um, again, it's going to be varied based off of the element, right? But developmental, reproductive, nervous, and renal symptoms, um, your renal um, system is your kidney kidneys. Um, it's going to hurt your liver because you're trying to filter this out all the time, including I, same thing with the kidneys, and it can include cancers. I have a good little um, diagram here showing the reproductive system, the nervous system, the digestive system, all of the different types of, um, of uh, effects that we can have for heavy metals. And again, this is um, generalized, and it's going to be specific for each type of heavy metal. All right. For example, we know that lead leads to cognitive um, problems and lower IQ in children. Now, two of the most common and toxic heavy metals are lead and mercury. And since we've already talked about lead in our atmospheric pollution unit, let's talk about mercury here. Now, mercury, chemical symbol Hg, also known as quicksilver because it is a liquid at room temperature, um, it is toxic. You would not drink it. Methyl mercury, though, is even more toxic. Methyl mercury is Hg. CH3. So you just slap on a methyl group to that mercury um, atom. So you see that methyl group there, the carbon and three hydrogens. Okay. How do you get methyl mercury? Well, it's anaerobic bacteria that are going to um, that are going to create this methyl mercury. So mercury is going to get into the atmosphere or into the waterways, um, primarily via industry or from a coal burning power plant, coal that has associated mercury and the rock uh, with it. And it can get into the atmosphere or just straight into the water. It can also be discharged naturally from weathering or volcanoes, okay? But at very low, at low concentrations compared to human activity. Uh, once it's in the atmosphere, it can cycle globally. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be in an area that has lots of in, um, uh, a lot of uh, industry or coal burning power plants. But it's going to be more concentrated in those areas. And it's going to enter the waterways, either by just flowing down the river or by just um, precipitating into the ocean. And when it does so, there's going to be anaerobic bacteria that are in the soil or in the water. We're showing the ocean here, but they occur in the soil as well. Um, those anaerobic bacteria are going to convert mercury to methylmercury. Okay. Um, Roughly about 10% of the methylmercury in the soil or the water is going to enter your food web where it starts to biomagnify. And that essentially means that it increases in concentration as you go um, up the food chain. So we're going to talk about bioaccumulation and biomagnification at the end of this PowerPoint. So keep this concept in mind that mercury can um, bioaccumulate and biomagnify. And essentially what you're going to see is as you go higher up, there is a higher concentration of mercury in, um, in the organism at the higher trophic levels. Okay. And from here, it can enter into the human system, right? If we eat fish or if we uh, drink untreated water, right, it can be in the rivers. Okay. Um, even uh, plants can have some methylmercury and then that they, uh, that they draw up from the soil and they sequester in a vacuole. Once it's in humans, it's readily, um, deposited in fatty tissue or into the brain, which is very fatty, and it can cross um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the mother-child uh, placental barrier into the fetus. And we know that mercury and methylmercury are associated with decreased cognition, neurological impairment, um, 
and some cognitive birth uh, defects. So it is very alarming for a developing fetus to be exposed to mercury, which is why pregnant women are told not to eat large predatory fish, such as salmon or tuna, especially oceanic large predatory fish. Marlin, swordfish, um, sharks would be other, ex other examples. In children or adults, again, decreased cognition, um, memory impairment, all of those things that go along with uh, decreased cognition. All right, the next thing that we're going to talk about are endocrine disruptors. This is any pollutant that interferes with your hormonal system or your endocrine system. So you should know that the endocrine system is your system of hormones in the body. doesn't necessarily have to be just the gender um, or the sex hormones like estradiol and testosterone, the two that I have pictured here. Note how similar they are. Uh, the only difference is occurring down here. Uh, they do come from the same precursor uh, molecule, but it can be any other um, hormones as well. So down here, we're talking about insulin and glucagon. Okay. Um, so any pollutant that interferes with the hormones. What they often do is mimic hormones. They can block hormones so they can bind to the receiver and block hormones or they can act as a catalyst uh, to chemically synthesize one hormone um, from possibly another or just chemically synthesize a hormone. Some examples, some notable examples. Um, bisphenol A, BPA. B BPA is used in a lot of food um, materials, so plastic bottles, uh, food containers, so like that plasticky uh, resin, um, it's really an epoxy lining on a food container. So you get um, takeout from a restaurant and you're in a, you're in a paper container and that paper is lined with BPA or some other similar uh, material. You see it lining in metal food cans. So next time that you uh, open up a can of baked beans or vegetables or whatever, wash out that can, which you should anyway to recycle it, but wash out that can and check out the inside of it. You'll see this epoxy coating on the inside of it, really thin plasticky coating on the inside of it, and that is most likely BPA. Okay. Um, there was a lot of consumer um, disgust, pushback, a little while ago about BPA and a lot of um, water bottles you'll see nowadays are labeled as BPA free. So this is probably where you've seen it before. But it's notable that most uh, many um, are still have BPA, especially your single use um, items. One of the most worrying of which is baby food formula cans. Okay, because this is a um, a uh, endocrine disruptor and you know children developing and producing lots of uh, lots of um, you know hormones especially at different times during development now BPA has been linked to diabetes breast and prostate cancer early um, puberty right and we're seeing puberty happen year like earlier and year earlier and earlier as the decades progress and a lot of it is thought to be due to these endocrine um, disruptors that are widespread in the environment and BPA is really good at mimicking estradiol and, es and testosterone, so that's why it's in a cancer most often associated with women, a cancer most uh, often associated with men, and then especially early puberty. You also can see neurological problems, and um, those neurological problems, especially in infants and fetuses. Okay, so it is very concerning, especially for newborns. Polychlorinated biphenyls or PCBs. These are a persistent organic pollutant, which we'll talk about later. So it kind of um, acts as both of these. And it has been used previously. It's banned right now in the US, like banned since 1978, worldwide banned since 2001. But it was used as an industrial coolant and lubricant and also in a lot of electronics. So it was used as, a, um, as an insulator in a lot of electronics. And that's especially common in transformers, capacitors, resistors, etc. And your large transformers that you see on on power lines used to contain PCBs, and they still do contain PCBs in many areas. If you're in an area that um, the electrical grid was all established and built before 1978, so we're talking about the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And if it hasn't been um, renovated, so say maybe you're in a poor district of the United States, it's just cheaper and easier to slap a warning sign onto 
these transformers rather than to replace all of them in that district. So you'll see these warning signs, especially in rural areas that are older, um, older areas of the United States and um, relatively impoverished areas. These can leak and it's been shown that they often do link, uh, leak and you get these PCBs going into the soil and into your waterways. They have been linked with skin, liver, and brain cancers. This is typically acute exposure. So these were workers at the, um, at the plants where they were being used. And that's one of the biggest reasons that they were banned in the 1970s was because of acute exposure for workers. Chronic exposure has been linked to birth defects, um, infertility, neurologic disease, and cancers. And for this acute exposure, you should include birth defects onto that also because um, you know, women working, pregnant women working at these plants did have a higher incidence of birth defects than the general population. Our next one are polybrominated diphenyl ethers, PBDEs. These are still widely used, especially in the United States. Most of them were banned in Europe in 2006, but they're still widely used in the United States. Um, you'll notice that as we move on through these biphenols, ethers this is not just one chemical it's a bunch of different chemicals that are closely related to one another okay so just fyi these are used as flame retardants um, anything that you don't want to burn um, you'll see the areas that we use them for um, but anything that you don't want to burn this is especially so for plastics but also for upholstery um, for for you know, natural fibers as well. You can coat them in polybro polybrominated diphenyl ethers. But let's say that we have, um, let's say that we have some plastic clothing, right? I'm wearing polyester right now. It might have PBDEs on it to use as a flame retardant so that if my shirt catches on fire, it doesn't just go up like, you know, like a, like, you know, super fast, like plastic should, or plastic typically does. Instead, you have this flame retardant on it that makes it to where it doesn't really burn as readily, and it doesn't, um, you know, totally give me three, third degree burns. I can get the shirt off before it really burns. Okay. Um, phthalates, these are very, very common. One of um, the most common plastics that you'll see is PET. Um, polyethylated phthalates, I believe. Um, polyethylene phthalate, I think. Don't quote me on that. Um, these are plastics. So phthalates are added, are part of plastics that are found in all kinds of uses. So I just have some of them here. Soft toys are of particular concern because we're talking about, you know, little kids putting them in their mouths and chewing on them. Maybe your dog chewing on it. Um, medical equipment, again, of particular concern. You have somebody that's getting an IV and the tubing that they're using has phthalates and those phthalates could come off in very, very, very small amounts. You know, we're talking about parts per million, parts per billion and get into somebody's bloodstream. Cosmetics that you put on your face. Okay. Some of these are pretty, um, pretty intimate um, items that we're using, right? They're, they're on, on your person or going inside of you. This can disrupt um, a couple different hormones, insulin and glucagon to, um, that have to do with metabolism. And then we see effects on male reproductive development and then masculinization of females. So these tend to mimic testosterone. They can lead to early puberty. They can lead to um, some developmental problems in males, but especially females where you see masculinization of females. Okay. Some other suspected endocrine disruptors, and I say suspected there because, uh, you know, legal issues, oxybenzone. Oxybenzone is found in a lot of sunscreens. So again, something that you rub onto your skin and can be absorbed through the skin. Um, it has been implicated in coral bleaching, which is why um, Aruba banned any sunscreen with oxybenzone in 2019. Palau banned any sunscreen with um, oxybenzone in 2020. And Hawaii um, in the United States banned any sunscreen with oxybenzone in 2021. Okay. Pesticides, we'll talk about um, atrazine in class. We'll talk about DDT later, but not in the term of endocrine disruptors, but we'll talk about specifically atrazine in class. 
And then contraceptives. There's a professor at the University of Colorado, Denver, when I was there, and I believe that he's still there, that works on this um, in the South Platte, where many, many, many people are using birth control pills. You know, female uses birth control pills. She pees out um, many of those chemicals, uh, ur urinates out many of those chemicals into the toilet. The wastewater treatment plant is not specifically designed to remove these chemicals from the treated water. And that treated water is um, sent out clean of all pathogens and nutrients, but not endocrine disruptors into the waterways. And then you have fish and amphibians that are exposed to these um, these chemicals that mimic estradiol and leads to reproductive um, reproductive uh, developmental issues. Okay, which we again will see mostly with atrazine, but it's interesting to think about contraceptives from our wastewater um, having the same impact. So how do these um, chemicals work? How do these endocrine disruptors work? Well, most of them mimic hormones, so they can bind to receptors where a hormone hormone would typically bind to. So if we look at estradiol with BPA, BPA is in purple there, you can see how BPA can easily bind to any receptor that is binding estrogen at this active site, right? Anything around there, it's going to bind to. It very closely mimics estrogen. That wasn't intentional. That's just, you know, how it worked out. At least I don't think it was intentional. Okay, so they can mimic hormone and bind to receptors, therefore blocking hormones or overexpressing a certain hormone. So it really kind of depends on the case. They can also act as catalysts to change one hormone into another, to create a hormone de novo or to break down a hormone. Okay, so anything to do with reacting with or mimicking hormones in the body. So in class, um, we're going to watch one of these two film uh, um, videos. I'm thinking about watching this one because I like it a little bit more, but this one is also very good. If you're interested in this, check out the second one, or if you're not going to be in class, watch them both. And then I intentionally skipped that last bullet point on that last slide. If you want to go back and read it, you can, but I wasn't going to say it just to be not so controversial. Um, oil spills. So crude oil can get into your waterway through many different ways. And it doesn't have to be your waterway. It can be ground surface as well. So um, talking about an oil spill from a leaking pipe, for example. All right, so how can it get into the environment? Um, first off, Oil naturally seeps in certain areas if it's close to the surface or if there's a fault or a crack in the rock or if there's, um, you know, even, even under at the bottom of the ocean. Oil can naturally seep. Not a problem in those areas because the organisms there become adapted to it and it's very localized and it's not a big deal. Where it is a big deal is when you have a massive influx of oil or even a minor influx of oil. Um, in an area where you have organisms that are not specifically adapted for that oil to occur. Okay, <clears throat> so how can they get into the environment? Well, damaged tankers, the most famous of which is the Exxon Valdez in 1989 in Alaska, but that is by no means the largest and is by no means um, an isolated incident. Ice, um, oil tankers, um, re, I mean, like there's oil spills from oil tankers all the time. If you want to go uh, check it out, go to Wikipedia and see a list. You'll be amazed at how many there are and how few of them you have ever heard of. Um, oil can leak from pipelines. So there was a leak in the Keystone pipeline in 2019. Um, but if you have a leak in a pipeline, a pipeline is moving oil, you know, sometimes hundreds of miles, even maybe thousands of miles. If you have a leak on one bolt or one gasket fails in that entire pipeline, you can have an oil leak in that area. Offshore rigs, you guys probably all know the Deepwater Horizon incident in 2010, um, where the Deepwater Horizon um, you know, exploded essentially kind of, um, and released lots and lots and lots of oil into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, oil can be intentionally dumped we don't see it very often, but you can see cases of intentionally dumping of oil. And then war, you don't see that very often um, either, but where you did see it was pretty massive. So the Kuwaiti oil fires of, and the Gulf War oil spill of 1991, especially, I, so essentially as um, Saddam Hussein was, uh, was retreating from Kuwait, he intentionally set the oil fields on fire and spilled oil in the Gulf um, there to, uh, to, to, to slow down the, the US forces. 
Okay. So the effects that oil has um, on ecosystems, these hydrocarbons are toxic for many organisms, especially if they're ingested, but even topic um, like a topic uh, on the surface of an organism on their skin or whatever, they, it, it is toxic. Okay. Um, you typically see liver and kidney damage because you're trying to process these um, these uh, chemicals and you're trying to get them out of the body and your liver and kidney are the two organs that are responsible for that primarily. In the water, oil can coat bird plumage and mammal fur. What this does is it reduces buoyancy, it reduces insulation, and it reduces their mobility. A bird that is coated in oil cannot fly. Okay, all of their um, little filaments on their feathers stick together and it doesn't provide lift um, for them to be able to fly. These otters rely on the little um, droplets of, or sorry, not droplets, but the little uh, bubbles of air that gets trapped in their fur to help them float and to provide them insulation. Well, the oil basically coats all the fur, smashes it down next to the body or adheres it down next to the skin and they no longer have these little um, bubbles of air. They no longer have insulation, so they can freeze in these very cold waters, and they have to struggle to stay afloat. So they could possibly drown and die. If it gets in the eyes, it can blind animals. It can mask scents and waters, so this especially hunts, or sorry, especially hurts any organism that relies on scent for hunting. And it can result in mothers abandoning offspring if they don't have scent cues. Otters is another good example of that. Um, surface oil reduces light for photosynthesis. It coats algae, so those algae can die. It coats plankton, kelp, gra sea grasses, all of these, it can coat them and prevent photosynthesis from occurring. But even if you have oil just floating on the surface, which it typically does float, not always, but most of the time um, it floats, and it just reduces the photosynthetic, um, the amount of light um, for photosynthesis that goes into that water column and reduces um, net primary production. Most oil is going to float, but some of it does sink and it kills benthic organisms um, in pretty much the same ways as above. Okay, so it's not just that all oil floats. Some of these heavier hydrocarbons, especially they become kind of waterlogged in a sense, can end up sinking. So that was by no means an exhaustive list of the impacts on organisms, but it's a pretty good starter list. Okay, um, now Oil spills also have human impacts. Um, it does hurt uh, local economies, right? Not only are you losing that oil that you could otherwise sell, right? All of this is non-recoverable, um, pretty much. You can't sell it anymore. But the clean on, the cleanup is going to cost a lot of money, a lot of human labor, and a lot of time, right? It's going to reduce tourism in the area. So if this pretty beach um, used to have lots of tourists, no tourists are gonna come if it's coated in oil. The Deepwater Horizon incident in 2010, 13 years ago, um, is what I'm gonna use for really all of these. It was a huge cost of cleanup. Um, the EPA and uh, FEMA had a huge cost of cleanup as well as local communities. There was a massive reduction in tourism in the Gulf states, um, especially like you know the Gulf Coast. It negatively impacted fisheries. Um, the shrimp industry still has not fully recovered from this, uh, from that oil spill. There was just, it just so heavily impacted um, the fishing industry and the Gulf states that they're still feeling the effects of it. There's long-term ecological impacts as well. There's an article that I linked to Schoology from just about a week ago, so 13 years after the incident, um, the Deepwater Horizon incident, that talks about how um, how the salt marshes started to die, the salt marshes along the Gulf, uh, the Gulf Coast started to die due, due to the influx of oil. So the oil essentially poisoned the plants along the coast. And because the plants were no longer there to hold the soil or the sediment in place, the coast started to erode away. And then as they eroded away, the oil that got locked in the soil and in the dead plants was deposited on a new set of plants a little bit further inland, kills them, and then erodes away that soil. So there's these long-term ecological impacts that you know nobody would have predicted before the oil spill um, occurred and before they detected it a decade later. How can we clean up oil spills? All of these are going to be costly, labor-intensive, and or time-consuming, some of them more so than others for some of these things. Um, the first one that I think is the best in terms of um, being environmentally friendly is to use 
some species of bacteria that can metabolize oil. So they can munch through oil and metabolize oil. There's not many species of bacteria that can do it, but if you have a really good large lab culture of these specific species, you can release them into, um, into your waterways right after an oil spill and they can start to get rid of that oil for you. So it's kind of using nature to help with this. If you can accelerate this whole process by um, by um, using mechanical methods such as skimming, which I'm showing right here. So they're skimming that oil along the surface. Again, most oil is going to float, 98% of it uh, floats. So you can skim that oil, bring it all into a certain area, and then dump all of those bacteria in there. You can use certain binder molecules that conglomerate the oil. Um, or you can use chemical solidifiers to change that oil from a liquid to a solid to help with this process, any way that you can concentrate this oil. Another way to clean this up is what they call chemical dispersants. Now, you add this chemical, which can be just as toxic as the oil, to the waterway. And that chemical causes the oil slick to break up, to dissipate, it actually, it, it sort of acts as a uh, surfactant. And you cause those oil molecules to just kind of, by sight, like disappear by sight. They don't disappear in reality. You just can't see them anymore. They just dissipate. It kind of just spreads the oil out all everywhere and you can't see it anymore and everything's all hunky-dory and you can bring back tourism, but it doesn't get rid of the oil. It doesn't get rid of the carbon um, hydrocarbons. It just disperses them in the water. So I don't think it's a great solution, but it is one very common way of cleaning them up. Another is a chemical uh, solidifier, which is very similar, except the opposite. Um, they can be pollutants themselves as well, but they change that oil from a liquid to a solid and you can more easily clean it up, such as scraping it off of a beach or whatever. Control burning. This is probably the most common and the cheapest. All that you do is burn the oil, okay? Super easy to remove it. All that you do is throw a match into the water. I'm sure it's more complicated than that. Maybe a flare. Um, and it just burns all of that oil on the surface. That does create a lot of air pollution and environmental damage itself, but it is very effective at getting rid of those hydrocarbons. And it's very quick and very easy and very cheap and requires the least amount of labor. Dredging is something that you'd have to do for the oil that sinks. Okay, so we've talked about dredging several times. It's basically scooping up sediment at the bottom of a river, at the bottom of the ocean, etc. Skimming, we just talked about, so it's um, shown right here. Vacuuming is interesting, so you can skim all this and then suck up that oil. So these two are, um, can be used in tangent. Beach raking, you are seeing um, both of these people up here doing that. One person is actually using a rake, one person using a shovel, but you know, big deal. And then washing of anim um, animals. The effectiveness of this is um, variable, but it's better than doing nothing. And many animals have been saved by washing. It is um, just that some of these animals um, are so poisoned by it that they that they succumb to their um, that they succumb to the toxins regardless. Now there is new tech that's always being researched and. One thing that um, I've seen is that like human hair is really good at binding to oil. So for whatever reason, oil binds to human hair very well. So you use skim skimmers that have human hair and you can just like drop it in like a mop into the water and then kind of bring it up all laden with oil. That's some new tech. I would caution you from using new tech um, on an AP test because if it hasn't been proven um, as a solution, I would avoid using it. Okay. Now, obviously, it's going to be best to prevent spills rather than clean them up afterwards. And this is one of the arguments for transition away from fossil fuels is because if you're not using oil at all, then you never have an oil spill. All right, the last set of toxins that we'll talk about are persistent organic pollutants or POPs or POPs. Um, I'm probably just going to call them persistent organic pollutants. These are any organic molecule. They do have to be organic that resist breakdown by any means. That could be biological means, so they're not metabolized by bacteria or fungi or other decomposers. Could be chemical means, so just um, reacting with uh, inorganic chemicals in the environment. And it could be photolytic means, so that's like reacting by light, okay? So especially ultraviolet radiation will not degrade these like many um, chemicals are. 
For this reason, they're also called forever chemicals. You'll see them referred to as forever chemicals by the news media a lot rather than persistent organic pollutants because uh, the general populace is too stupid to have three words in a row. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Forever chemicals. <laughs> okay, persistent organic pollutants. Um, these persist in the environment for years, decades, centuries, or even thousands of years. Okay, some of these are gonna be in the environment for thousands of years. Almost all of these are gonna be synthetic. Some of them do in, um, occur naturally. For example, dioxins, which we'll talk about, occur um, naturally whenever you combust anything that has a high concentration of chlorine in them, um, but not many organic molecules do. And most of those are petrochemicals, so really it's like synthetic, but they can be released from volcanism as well. They include a lot of different um, types and for a lot of um, different uh, uses. Many of them are lipid soluble and therefore bioaccumulate and biomagnify in fatty tissue, um, which we'll talk about in one of the future slides. Many of the examples that we'll talk about have been found in most human blood, like virtually every human blood has a chemical called PFOA in it. And you have to go to like the most isolated groups of people on the planet to find um, to find uh, somebody that does not have PFOA in their blood. You and I, guaranteed we do. I'd put $1,000 on it, okay? Now, one piece of legislation that I have referenced before and will reference um, in the coming slides is the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. You do not need to know this one for the AP test. So I'm gonna go through it really, really quickly. It was signed in 2001, effective 2004. As of 2019, 184 party nations have signed it. Notably though, the US has not, Italy has not, Israel has not, so there is not consensus around the world. But this does control a lot of, um, a lot of uh, persistent organic pollutants and prevents them from being used or manufactured. And there should be noted that the US EPA has a lot of overlap with this list. So that's one of the reasons that the US didn't uh, sign on board, but honestly, I think that they should have. Now, some notable persistent organic pollutants um, that we'll talk about. All of these examples have been banned worldwide due to the Stockholm Convention, with the notable exception of DDT, which is still being used to control mosquitoes for malaria and other um, mosquito-borne illnesses. But I've put these into different classes. The first class is pesticides. Um, DDT is the most um, famous pesticide, dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane. We'll talk about it a little bit more on the next slide. Um, these second generation pesticides um, are also all banned. In fact, um, DDT is a, uh, is a second generation pesticide also. Um, where you'll see these is if you ever read the book um, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, which you actually will read a section of for this class. Um, very famous book, started off the environmental movement. All of these were banned in the United States primarily because of um, Silent Spring. Uh, flame retardants. Many brominated ethers and brominated diethers have been banned, um, but they're used as flame retardants, very similar to the ones that we talked about before. Um, per and polyfluorinated, or sorry, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFAs. Okay, you'll see this a lot because they're one of the ones that are coming up more and more in the news. Um, these were used as, surf or are being used still, many of them. Um, surfactants, flame retardants, oil and waterproofing, nonstick coatings. Um, the one that we're gonna talk about is PFOA, perfluorooctanoic acid, or C8. You may have heard of that before, but we'll talk about it in one of the future slides. Um, PCBs, so see those endocrine disruptors for the PCBs and then polychlorinated dibenzodioxins, PCDDs. Um, these are inaccurately referred to as dioxins, and I'm gonna perpetuate that by referring to them as dioxins from here on out. So some three notable ones that I wanna expand on, DDT, dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane. Um, you can see the chemical structure of it in the top um, center. What I want you to think of is, Anything with chlorine, just whenever you see chlorine in a molecule, think of it about being toxic, 
Okay, this is a pesticide that was widely used since World War One. Now it was first chemically synthesized in the mid early 1800s, but it wasn't identified as a pesticide until 1939 by Paul Mueller, who was subsequently awarded the Nobel Prize for identifying this as a pesticide. And it's kind of ironic that we later banned it after we figured out how bad it was. Um, some of the pictures that you see here are some human exposure to it. So they used the army, uh, the US Army used to use DDT as a lice um, and really any other arthropod um, um, like uh, uh, preventative um, and, and treatment. So this fellow right here is getting his hair sprayed with DDT to eliminate lice. These people are using it indoors and this person is standing in a field that's being crop dusted by DDT, right? These people are all getting exposure. And even nowadays, we can still use DDT um, specifically to control uh, mosquitoes, but its use is used um, illegally to, as, a, as a pesticide on fields um, somewhat often, not very often at all, um, rather rarely actually, okay? Um, again, DDT was banned in 1972, in large part due to um, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, a decade prior. And before it was banned, about 600,000 tons of DDT were used just in the United States. So this was, there is a lot of it. And again, it is a persistent organic pollutant. So this DDT that was used in the United States ends up in the waterways around the United States, right? Rural runoff ends up in the waterways, ends up in the ocean, and now we have DDT circulating in the ocean, potentially from the 19, uh, 1960s and 1950s, okay? Dioxins are the second um, notable group that I want to talk about. Now, most dioxins are not intentionally produced. The vast majority of them, and there are tons, notice these variables right here. Um, those mean that these can go on for like quite some time, uh, chains. Um, basically, what dioxin means is that there's these two chlorinated benzene rings that are held together by these oxygen bridges. Anyway, not important. Um, most dioxins are not intentionally produced. Very few of them are intentionally produced for industry. Most of them are a byproduct, um, unintentional byproduct. That unintentional byproduct is anything that has to do with chlorine. So think about um, bleaching of most things. So um, bleaching paper, for example, um, using very highly concentrated chlorine um, like bleach. Um, it's going to be due to uh, smelting, uh, metal smelting, anything that contains chlorine, a rock that contains chlorine, you're probably gonna be emitting some dioxins. These are gases for the most part, but they can be uh, water soluble as well. Um, and then incineration. This is the primary cause of dioxins, especially anything that contains um, chlorine, right? PVC is a great example, polyvinyl chloride, right? Um, now, in February of this year, 2023, there was a train um, derailment in Ohio where they released lots and lots and lots of vinyl chloride, the monomer to make polyvinyl chloride. One of the, after quite a while, um, one of the responses was to burn off much of that vinyl chloride that released lots and lots and lots of dioxins into the atmosphere. That was one of the, um, that was a huge environmental disaster. I mean, maybe not huge, but it was a pretty big environmental disaster. The primary source within incineration of all dioxins is backyard barrel burning. So we've talked about um, recycling copper before in this class. You can recycle copper. It's great to recycle copper. Now, how do you get copper wire out of the plastic that is used to insulate it and coat it? Well, you can use a razor blade and slice off that plastic and just go to town slicing off that plastic. And it's very labor intensive and it takes a long time. Or you can take all that copper um, wire with the plastic on it, the plastic insulation, put it into a metal barrel, light it on fire and burn off all that plastic and then recover the copper, which does not burn, okay? That's the most common way to do it, especially if you are poor and trying to recycle copper for an income and um, you know time is, is, is money, right? So you're gonna burn it all off. That's gonna release a lot of dioxins into the atmosphere.
Okay. And there is many different compounds. I would encourage you to check out the Wikipedia page for dioxins and just scroll through all of the, uh, all of the different compounds. But in general, they can bioaccumulate and biomagnify, which we still are going to talk about. They can lead to thyroid disorders, nervous system disorders, cancers, developmental disorders, et cetera. All right, probably the most infamous case of dioxin exposure was through the herbicide and defoliant agent orange during the Vietnam War. Um, so a little bit of backstory, the U.S. is fighting, I mean, the, fighting the North Vietnamese, who were communists, backed by China, led by Ho Chi Minh, also known as the Viet Cong. Um, the Viet Cong were very good at guerrilla warfare. They were essentially kicking the U.S.'s butt on the ground um, because the U.S. had a more traditional fighting style, was not um, used to fighting in dense jungle, and the, Viet, the North Vietnamese had a very intimate um, knowledge of the terrain and the jungle and were very good at guerrilla warfare. Right, they would pop out of the jungle, um, kill a whole bunch of U.S. soldiers, and then go right back into the into the jungle and without losing a single person. Okay, very simplified but basic history. The U.S.'s response was essentially a scorched earth response, but instead of burning the entire jungle, what they did was use um, chemicals to do something similar. They removed, all right, they used defoliants and herbicides. 245T and 24D um, to remove the leaves and kill the plants um, in these jungles. Essentially, if your quarry goes to ground, leave no ground to go to. That was their thought. If they couldn't hide in the jungle, then you could um, defeat them. So they sprayed DDT over wide stretches of Vietnam. It's estimated that about 12% of the total land area of South Vietnam was sprayed by um, Agent Orange. I think I just said DDT, I don't know why, but Agent Orange. Um, DDT was not used, I mean, it was probably used by the US to combat lice, but not for, um, not as a defoliant, it's a pesticide. Okay, so Agent Orange. They sprayed 12% of the land area of South Vietnam with Agent Orange, plus areas in North Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Over 20 million gallons of Agent Orange were sprayed. And even though the numbers have not been released by the US military and the US military would refute these numbers, um, advocacy groups in the United States, um, veteran advocacy groups estimate that every single soldier in Vietnam was exposed to Agent Orange to some degree. Even if you're back in base camp, um, still being exposed from trace amounts in the wind, trace amounts in the water, trace amounts in food. Okay. The Vietnamese government and the U.S. Um, highly refutes these. The U.S. government definitely refutes these claims, but I tend to trust the people that are on the ground living with it rather than a country halfway around the world that did the damage. But anyway, um, the Vietnamese claim that 4.8 million people, um, 4.8 Vietnamese people were exposed to Agent Orange during the war. 400,000 were killed or maimed, 500,000 birth defects resulted from Agent Orange exposure, and the Red Cross estimates that a million people are still living with the negative health effects of Agent Orange. And it wasn't the active ingredients in Agent Orange itself that led to this, although I would almost put money on it that they are toxic. It was mostly this TCDD, tetrachlorodibenzodioxin, which Agent Orange was contaminated with. And due to this contamination, these people were um, were exposed to this this dioxin. And again, you can read the cancers. I'm going to skip that, but heavy, heavy human toll on both uh, U.S. personnel and the Vietnamese um, who did not know that they were being exposed to these types of chemicals. Although I'm sure that when you're a person on the ground being burned by high concentrations of this uh, defoliant and herbicide that you know that you're being exposed to harmful chemicals. Anyway, let's talk about perfluorooctanoic acid, PFOA, C8. I'd like to show a documentary about this, but I think it's too long. We'll probably watch a short video about it. This is one of the many PFAs um, that exist. Again, these are per and polyfluorinated alkyl or polyfluoroalkyl substances. I always say that wrong. And you see all of the fluorines on it. Just like chlorine, whenever you see tons of fluorine, stay away from it. Um, so polyfluorinated. And you should know from chemistry or biology that every time that you see one of these branches or one of these uh, bins in an organic molecule, there's a carbon there, okay? So we just don't draw in all the carbons. These were used as surfactants, flame retardants, oil and water um, proofing, and nonstick coatings. Um, PFOA is 
specifically and notoriously used in the production of Teflon, which you probably have um, a Teflon or Teflon-like pan at home. But it was found in industrial waste from these uh, Teflon um, producing factories, uh, most notably in the eastern and midwestern United States, but you see it in a lot of other uses as well and a lot of other objects. So anything that you don't want to get stained, that could be clothing, that could be carpeting. Whenever you see waterproof clothing, I would stay away from it. Um, whenever you have like a plasticky, um, a plasticky like uh, lining to a to a paper bag, to a, a cardboard box, it could be BPA, it could be PFOA or PFAs in general. Okay, um, I, I would tend to stay away, stay away from those. Now, PFOA has been found in the blood of 99% of the sampled US population, around or below one part per billion. But again, I would put $1,000 on it that every single one of us that's watching this video has PFOA in our blood, okay? Um, in higher concentrations, it's implicated in, ki in kidney, testicular, colon, and prostate cancers, ulcerative colitis, especially the more severe cases of it, thyroid disease, high cholesterol, pregnancy-induced hypertension, birth defects, miscarriages, et cetera. Okay. So it was banned in the United States and w using the Stockholm um, and with the Stockholm um, Convention, but very similar um, molecules are being used, most notably Gen X is now being used in replacement, which is probably just as bad. You just take one chemical that you um, have tested repeatedly and found that it has negative health effects and ban it and then substitute it for a very chemically similar chemical that you haven't tested yet. Probably just as bad. Now this is probably the video that we'll watch in class, um, but check out this article. It's on, um, it's on Schoology also if you're interested, optional. And let's wrap this up by talking about bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Now, bioaccumulation is the gradual buildup of chemicals in organisms. And this is um, essentially that the rate of absorption of these chemicals is greater than the rate of breakdown or excretion. And you typically don't break them down and you typically don't excrete them. You just um, stash them away unintentionally in fatty tissue. Most of these are going to accumulate in fatty tissue, but you're going to accumulate them greater than or equal, sorry, greater than the rate of breakdown or excretion. Okay, most often it's gonna be um, your persistent organic pollutants and heavy metals, okay? Now some animals use this as a defense mechanism. Um, monarch butterflies are a great example. Monarch butterflies live on the, um, live off of milkweed, which is toxic to everything else because um, it has cardiac glycosides in it. And these monarch butterflies are immune to that poison and they um, bioaccumulate it in their tissue so that the monarch is therefore poisonous. So some of these, some animals naturally do this, but they're adapted to do so. Okay, they are definitely not adapted um, for lead, persistent organic pollutants, etc. And bioaccumulation leads to biomagnification also known as bioamplification, but you'll almost certainly see this term. This is when you increase the co um, concentration of a toxin or a pollutant um, as you increase in the trophic levels. So in this example on the right, let's say that we have DDT in our water. Our, D our concentration of DDT in the water is 0 0.000003 parts per million. Okay, but let's say that phytoplankton um, eat up that or sorry, let's say there's phytoplankton in the water. They're swimming in that water all day, every day. Sorry, swimming. They're floating in that water all day, every day. They're absorbing that water to do photosynthesis and they're absorbing trace amounts of DDT as well. But they're doing it all the time and they're accumulating that DDT in their little phyto phytoplankton bodies, okay? They're gonna have maybe 0 0.0005 parts per million. And then zooplankton eat those phytoplankton and the zooplankton are swimming around in this DDT laced water, getting it from the water itself. And they're eating all of these, um, these uh, phytoplankton that have DDT in their bodies and they're eating them all day, every day. And they start to accumulate more and more and more DDT. And now they have 0 0.04 parts per million. And then the small fish eat the phytoplankton and you see where I'm going with this. They're um, swimming in that water laced with 
this baseline amount of DDT all the time. That DDT is getting into their bloodstream via the gills, and they're eating this steady diet of zooplankton that has 0.04 parts per million of DDT all the time, all day, every day. And they accumulate up to, uh, and it magnifies up um, the trophic level, and they accumulate 0.5 parts per million. And then the big fish, accumulates even more, magnifies even further. And then finally, when you sample the osprey that's eating this steady diet of fish, large fish that has two parts per million of DDT in their bodies, and the osprey's only diet, all that it eats is these fish, then it ends up having about 25 parts per million DDT in its body. Way, 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 way higher than the baseline amount in the water that this osprey isn't even swimming around in. Okay, so a couple examples, DDT and mercury, you'll see here, um, DDT causes eggshell thinning in birds. We'll watch um, a video kind of talking about this. And then mercury or methylmercury more appropriately, um, again, in your large fish, and this is why pregnant women shouldn't be eating large fish because they're getting, um, you know, maybe one, two, five parts per million methylmercury that can be transferred straight to the fetus and lead to neurological disorders. All right, and the last thing that we're going to talk about is tacking on a piece of legislation to this PowerPoint, and that is the Delaney Clause. So the Delaney Clause, it's a little bit weird that they have you know this, but you do need to know this piece of legislation. Um, this is part of the Food Additives Amendment. Um, sorry, this is part of the Food Additives Amendment of 1958, which in itself is part of the Food, Drugs, and Cosmetics Act. So this is like one clause in an amendment that is part of this larger act. So it's it's really odd. So it basically um, gives the FDA oversight over the safety of food, drugs, medicine, and cosmetics, but we are specifically looking at this one clause. So what is that one clause? So what is the Delaney Clause? It's basically um, saying that no chemical additive can be put into food that's been known to cause cancer in either humans or animals. Um, it's important to say or animals because a lot of the tests that are being done for carcinogens are on lab um, animals, mice, rats, monkeys, etc. Right now, it covers food additives. It covers any animal drugs that can accumulate in um, any type of tissue or product from animals, color additives, or naturally occurring carcinogens. So for example, you cannot buy root beer that contains sassafras root because saffron is known to cause carcinogen. Okay, so all root beer is pretty much uh, no longer flavored with this and it is artificial flavors. It used to apply to pesticide levels in processed foods, but only when their concentrations increased during processing, so that was a little bit weird. It never applied to pesticides on raw food, so it does not test and does not cover pesticides on raw food. Okay, so you, you can have pesticides residue on a head of broccoli, for example. Now, pesticides, I say used to be on this because they were removed from the Delaney Clause in 1996 when they were added to the Food Quality Protection Act, which you don't really need to know, nor do you need to know any of these dates. This right here is what you need to know. Now, a little bit of history about the enforcement of the Delaney Clause. It was written back in the 1950s before we really had these uh, tools for analytical chemistry to detect very minute amounts of um, chemicals, of toxins, of known carcinogens. So at the time, it was really difficult to differentiate between high concentrations and super trace amounts. So even though we can detect trace amounts um, today, we have this de minimis clause. And the de minimis clause basically says, if a carcinogenic food additive is present at a concentration less than one part per million, it's considered negligible and it is allowed. So this doesn't the Delaney Clause is not a blanket statement saying that no carcinogens can be in food. There is this de minimis exemption to it, and even though we can detect one part per million um, of a known carcinogen um, in our food, that is not going to be enforced on the Delaney Clause because of this uh, of this exemption. Okay, so even though we can detect it, it's still permissible because it's considered a trace amount and is considered safe. All right, so my goal was to keep this PowerPoint under an hour, which I am going to fail at if I go through all the learning objectives. Um, but just read through these, um, be familiar with them. We pretty much talked about all of them and all the points and expanded on quite a few of it. Um, so we should be good. Any questions, let me know. Send me an email, come to office hours, and I hope you guys learned something, and I'll see you on class. Bye.